The show is strictly for educational purposes. The opinions expressed on the show are personal to the individuals appearing in the show and not those of Thinking Tree Ecoholics Private Limited. The show is not intended to offend or defame any individual, entity, caste, community, race or religion or to denigrate any institution, person, living or dead. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Hello and welcome to Ecoholics Thinking Tree series. Our guest for today needs no introduction. Though he owns a CV that would require an entire episode to address Currently, he is the CV star professor of economics at the Department of Finance, New York University Stern School of Business. He served as the deputy governor of Reserve Bank of India during 2017 to 2019. He is also a founding member of Pratham UK, the UK chapter of Pratham, an Indian NGO providing pre-primary and primary education to unprivileged and underprivileged children in India. His forthcoming book, Quest for Restoring Financial Stability in India talks about the causes, consequences, and remedies of the increasing dominance of financial sector and central banking outcomes by India's growing fiscal deficit in conversation with Dr. Viral Acharya. Welcome, sir. Welcome to our show. Uh, thank you, Sanat. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm uh, delighted and happy to discuss about the book. Uh, it's already released uh, on 24th of July, and uh, I'm happy to share some of the insights that I'm trying to provide in the book. To begin with, sir, as we know that this pandemic is not something that any country's central bank could have prepared itself for. How do you see the decisions made by Reserve Bank of India in the light of COVID-19? Uh, you are absolutely right, Sanat. Uh, this is something that not just the central bank, uh, even the government authorities uh, could not have uh, prepared for. It's a very large, uh, unprecedented shock. Uh, nevertheless, uh, something to keep in mind is that countries that had better initial conditions uh, in the sense of having more policy buffers to respond, uh, be it on the fiscal side, be it on the financial side, uh, of course, have greater capacity uh, to accommodate uh, such a shock. Uh, typically, when the shock is so aggregate, then it's likely to have both a supply side shock because of the lockdown, uh, but there will also be a demand side shock because the discretionary spending is also likely to come down. Uh, and, you know, these shocks would require uh, both fiscal and monetary accommodation as the International Monetary Fund uh, and the other uh, multilateral agencies have been pushing. Uh, I think overall, uh, you know, given our initial conditions and in spite of uh, all the challenges, the government and the central bank have adopted a slew of different measures. Uh, by and large, emerging markets have not been able to provide as large a fiscal relief uh, as the developed economies have been able to. Uh, this is for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, the developed markets are the so-called safe havens. Uh, there is greater credibility and commitment on repayment of cash flows, preservation of currency values, uh, you know, in the sense that currency won't lose value because of runaway inflation, etc. So in spite of the nature of the shock, typically the safe haven borrowing costs come down very significantly in international markets. This is, of course, not always so for emerging markets. They are not safe havens. They're uh, both ability and willingness to repay debts doesn't have as much commitment uh, yes. as, the, as the developed countries do. So that, of course, limits the policy space to start with. So if you see developed economy expenditures have often uh, been in the range of 10 to 15 percent of GDP, whereas many emerging market economy responses are below that and in some cases even less than 5 percent of uh, GDP. Uh, second point here is that where the fiscal capacity is not adequately present, uh, and certainly sovereigns have been concerned about their uh, ratings assessment. And, you know, that is really just a concern about debt sustainability concerns in the minds of investors and markets. So where that capacity is not very high, and certainly this has been a consideration in case of India as well, uh, effectively the packages have been designed to be more off balance sheet which means either through uh, provision of credit, uh, maybe at easier terms, 
uh, or through central bank accommodation through monetary easing, either through cutting of rates or pumping of excessive liquidity. Uh, and given these two points, you can anticipate uh, and understand why India's package is also more loaded uh, on the second side, which is it's more loaded on relief being provided through the banking system as well as through the central bank ammunition. Now, uh, of course, in case of India, there are other aspects to the COVID shock. We had the migrant crisis. We have yeah. uh, we have the rural India, where sometimes the delivery is not always as effective of various services. Uh, the government seems to have done a good job both in undertaking, I would say, certain critical agri reforms uh, and providing food security given the vast storage of food grains uh, that it had over this period. I think the question that is going to be a challenge in the coming days is that uh, unfortunately our health curve has not looked great. Mm. Uh, the infections are continuing to rise. We are now seeing more than 50,000 to 60,000 new cases per day. Uh, fatalities are rising in the range of 800 to 900 per day right now. Uh, and in terms of percentage growth from the total number of cases already, uh, India is actually right now the fastest growing uh, case count. Uh, this is going to mean that uh, it may be hard for economic recovery to uh, get off on a sound footing uh, because as you will see from perhaps just around you that uh, because of the risk of infection, because of the concern that you may not have enough hospital care, healthcare infra available if numbers rise, uh, people are gradually cutting back behaviorally on their own discretionary expenditures. They are just doing what may be the bare minimum. And that makes it hard to create jobs for others. It also makes it hard to get a sound economic footing. And the question everyone is asking is, given the state of the infection curve, will there be a need for more direct fiscal transfers, uh, either as uh, sort of direct transfers to individuals? Will certain most affected sectors require some kind of direct government support. Uh, and we can chat more about this, but the key question is how does one create space uh, for this yes. kind of support? Uh, in, in the context of the book, what I would like to highlight is that uh, some of the recent measures undertaken by the Reserve Bank of India to provide restructuring relief to certain sectors uh, I would have preferred them to work through the insolvency and bankruptcy code, perhaps allowing the promoters to retain control of their enterprises for a change, uh, maybe for the post-COVID uh, bankruptcies. Um, and importantly, I would have liked uh, the banking system to be asked uh, to shore up its equity capital base so that it has the capacity to absorb losses and yet maintain intermediation at healthy levels. I would in fact recommend this also for the non-bank finance sector. Mm -hmm. yes. So my sense is the fiscal and the financial stability angles uh, need to be given equal and important focus as we deal with the immediate needs of the COVID uh, post-COVID recovery or amidst COVID recovery. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, as I said, the book has some suggestions on how to go about doing that. Yes, yes, true. Uh, there's, uh, there's a very thin line between better management and abuse of discretionary power when it comes to autonomy. Uh, there also have been many debates in the recent past concerning the erosion of RBI's autonomy. What are your views on this? What are the steps needed for a better future? Yeah, I would say uh, essentially what I have highlighted in the book uh, and in my A.D. Shroff Memorial Lecture of 26th October 2018 is that uh, essentially the problem with discretion arises when the discretion is primarily being used in short run interests. Uh, and sometimes uh, political horizons because of the electoral cycles uh, can get woefully short. Uh, the focus may just be on the next three months, six months at best. Uh, whereas a central bank by very nature has a very long term mandate for protection of depositor interests, uh, maintaining price stability or inflation stability. 
uh, and uh, safeguarding the external sector of the economy. So I would say uh, there is, in general, a central bank leans against the pressures, the winds of such pressures, by adopting rules as much as possible, because that you, you are sort of tying yourself to the mast, as in the Odysseus uh, analogy, so that you don't have to give in to the calls of the sirens every time they come about. But of course, macroeconomic conditions may themselves uh, warrant some exceptional responses, some flexibility, some discretionary responses. Uh, I think the key is to ensure that they are not at the cost of sacrificing the long-term goals entirely. Uh, so sometimes you can push too far, that can risk financial stability. So for example, if you get banks to lend very aggressively over a very short period of time, usually the underwriting standards get very heavily eroded. Uh, so this is something we witnessed in the last decade and we are still trying to clean up the mess of that. Uh, we also, uh, have to factor in that when government deficits and debt programs become very large, the central bank simply can't go ahead and monetize it all. It also needs to have a path to actually keep inflation in check, normalize this liquidity supply, because otherwise you could have run away inflation and that could reduce credibility on the external side as well. So I would say that the, the key the key issue is that the central bank should have enough autonomy to say no. It should have enough uh, discipline to explain via reports when it takes extraordinary actions, why the discretion was exercised, what are its intended and unintended consequences, and what is the sunset clause? Because very yeah. often what happens is that the extraordinary measures become ordinary down the line, which is you just... You, you get mm -hmm. caught in a trap. It becomes a cul-de-sac, you know, you, it's a dead end sometimes because mm -hmm. the more you keep doing and the more it doesn't work, the more you want to double down and prove that it's going to eventually work. Well, uh, yes. And then <laughs> and then it becomes, uh, it, it becomes an unfortunate uh, trap uh, or capture of the past decisions uh, that the central bank has. So I think that's the fundamental trade-off and that's why I have been always pushing for the autonomy of the central bank, both in the letter of the law, uh, as well as in spirit. Uh, yes, yes. A quick question, sir. Like uh, Monetary Policy Committee came into the picture in 2016. Uh, do we consider as a like step towards autonomy? Uh, oh, absolutely, because uh, it is an institution. It's an institutional framework. The, the committee is mandated by law to target a specific level of consumer price inflation. Uh, there is a band on which deviations are allowed and that's to accommodate the concerns of growth as also the mandate says that you have to maintain this target of inflation while paying attention to growth. Uh, if the mandate is violated for three quarters in a row, so inflation is outside the band, a testimony has to be provided. Uh, and uh, importantly, there are embargo periods uh, before and after the uh, decision where uh, the members are not supposed to speak even to the government of India. Uh, yes. uh, and I think the mandate gives a very clear way of saying no, saying no. that, listen, my mandate, my legal mandate is to maintain a 4% inflation. Yes. Uh, I cannot just push it on the side and accommodate the short-term pressures okay. that you have. In fact, pressures were applied, meetings were sought, uh, and the structure of the MPC framework was used actually to not attend these meetings and to keep the committee okay. relatively at arm's length. So I think it is a very important step forward. What I'm trying to explain in the book uh, is that nevertheless, the pressures of fiscal dominance, uh, the fact that the government debt and borrowing programs are so large that they start pushing pressure on other aspects of central banking, such as regulatory policy. So in terms of giving uh, capital relief to banks, getting them to lend aggressively and to specific parts of the economy, uh, using uh, an excessively surplus liquidity conditions to reduce government costs of borrowing. Uh, that there are many other aspects through which uh, the central bank policies come under pressure. Uh, this is a very generalized form of fiscal dominance. It goes beyond the monetary policy. And we need to think hard about what is the institutional framework. Just the way we have the MPC framework for inflation targeting 
can we design institutional frameworks for other decisions of mm -hmm. the central bank so that these pressures of fiscal dominance can be mitigated mm -hmm. and the central bank remains free to pursue its long term interests rather than giving it to short term electoral pressures true true because there is monetary policy framework agreement as well as three independent members from the government side yes sir i was absolutely. reading absolutely and, and 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 just if i could add one point you know every yeah. member has to explain through minutes why they yeah. voted the way they do so this puts tremendous pressure and transparency on the system because the members have to they are going to be what what they have to say will be read scrutinized analyzed discussed debated uh and you know could maybe criticized uh, okay. and so you know that's that's tremendous discipline and transparency i would say and this is a very beneficial aspect of the framework moving on sir i was reading reading your book and you were beautifully optimistic when you said that no matter how deep in trouble our economy is with some changes backed by the ambitious indian youth everything can be brought on track Having said that there seems to be an underlying expectation of the people in the form of a major reform is our existing framework sufficient or do we need a major upgrade to fight off this pandemic and build a better banking system for the future uh that's a great question uh, sanat i would say not just for the banking system i think we also need significant reforms on the fiscal management of the economy uh Uh, i think certainly we need to adhere to the frbm targets in medium term i i explain why we need an independent bipartisan fiscal council yes. that would uh, both assess government's progress on the adherence and hold a mirror to the budgeting process uh, we need to reprioritize expenditures spend more perhaps on direct benefit transfers and on Uh, infrastructure health and education and perhaps much less on other kinds of subsidies which uh, which don't seem to be as effective in generating long run growth uh, we need to create tremendous transparency we need to take stock on where we are on the fiscal side uh, what is the total public sector borrowing requirement uh because then only then we will know how much of a course correction we need to undertake over the medium term uh, and finally we need very serious divestments uh, so that the government is using equity sales rather than borrowing uh, in order to fund uh, its necessary expenditures for the covid uh, relief and repair packages uh, on the financial stability side also i give many many suggestions i would say if i had to pick one to me the foremost is that Uh, we need uh, ownership neutral regulation of the banking system right now our public sector banks public sector owned non bank finance companies uh, the uh, certain acts such as the banking nationalization act they override the powers of the central bank uh, yes. in uh, in what it can do to deal with problem banks their management has failed underwriting standards have been poor equity capital is low Uh, right now the central bank is not able to impose the same uh, restrictions uh, or replacement of management or injection of new equity capital by selling the equity to new owners as it can for private banks it's not able to do that for public sector banks and i think this is a very important legislative change that is required of course another option that would solve this problem partly if the government was to simply reprivatize Uh, many of oh. these entities because then the government stakes would be gone and the banking nationalization acts uh, would not be as relevant uh, anymore uh, at a minimum though the government can divest away from majority stakes uh, i think this would reduce the fiscal burden uh, but simultaneously they may produce improvements in public sector banks because new owners might bring in better management practices uh, more incentive based compensation so being able to attract better human capital better risk management practices better technology digitization fintech and so on yes. uh, the last point i would make sanat is that the reforms are at present required not just on fiscal and financial stability side but i believe we might be in need of some serious structural transformational reforms on land labor ease of doing business so that the global supply chains which seem to be moving away from china both because of a cold war but also because of 
countries wanting to not be dependent geopolit geopolitically in a geopolitical risk sense on just having all their supplies coming from one country companies are wanting to diversify yes. away because yes. of both these reasons there's a movement away from china and the question is can india attract uh, some of that manufacturing uh, on onto its own shores but this requires that the businesses outside have both perception and commitment from the indian mm. side that 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 you know there will be ease of doing business when you come here uh, you know acquisition of land is a very big problem mm -hmm. actually uh, and you know if if some of those key thorny issues are resolved uh, i think that those could be very important reforms for india to undertake it's true because in the past we have just cut down the corporate tax and other things are remain as it is so it would not attract enough tax true sir Uh, in your book sir you have mentioned that authorities need to acknowledge the fact that banking sector problems are not different or separate from the fiscal stress india is facing do you think this ignorance reflects in our monetary and fiscal policies if yes what can be done about it uh yes sanat uh, i would say it's not ignored but what happens is fiscal dominance uh, which is that the government rather than addressing its own borrowing and deficits it turns to the central bank and says why don't we dilute the rules why don't we restructure certain packages uh, for corporates uh, without actually recognizing the losses let's keep the recapitalization bill of the public sector banks low uh, and nevertheless yet even though they may be adequate not be adequately capitalized let's get them to lend to the economy True. so what that creates is that because one aspect is not adjusting at all which is the fiscal side to recognize that some of the expenditures need to be budgeted for and spent rather than just be kicked down the road kicking the can down the road as they say because not capitalizing public sector banks is essentially tantamount to doing that it's basically not addressing the problem head on it's saying let me just tide over my current budget we will worry about this down the line but what happens is along the way there are significant costs because undercapitalized banks become very risk averse to undertaking fresh lending so they increase their margins they don't lend to the healthy borrowers at reasonable costs uh, and worse they are so focused on their legacy problems they don't want to mark their books for further losses so they end up doing what is called as zombie lending or evergreening of bad loans so yes. credit rather than going to the healthy productive parts of the economy instead goes to the less productive defaulted parts of the economy and this misallocation of credit can result in a very low growth productivity trap so i would say it's not that we are not aware of the problem in fact the key question to ask is that we have gone through this cycle in the last decade we were trying to fix it uh, through the central banks policies of directing the large defaulted cases to the insolvency and bankruptcy code the question is why did the progress stall all of a sudden mm, and yes. as i explain in the introductory chapter on fiscal dominance being a theory of everything in india uh, i try to explain that this is because the government horizons got extremely short uh, and that created a pressure to open up credit and liquidity taps in the economy rather than actually continuing the path of fiscal rectitude financial stability being anchored for 10 20 30 years time uh, and the bad loans legacy problem uh, being resolved decisively and efficiently as the insolvency and bankruptcy code would have allowed so i would say the problem is out there everyone knows about it but the system is not resisting the pressures of fiscal dominance and in my view the central bank the rest of the ecosystem needs to find ways both through open debate use of voice leaning against the wind playing the game of chicken and sometimes simply saying no that certain things cannot be compromised upon i think that's the way to in some sense throw the ball back into the court of the fiscal authorities uh, and have them make the adjustments so that overall we have a right balance in the economy between the government central bank the markets the banks 
and the private sector because we need all of them working together so that the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. You know, the analogy I always like to give is you can't drive a car well if only the front wheels are moving. Uh, you know, or you can't drive a car well if only one side of the car has uh, has air in the tires and the other side is flat. You know, it, it simply doesn't work. Uh, because we have seen the evidences from European Union where fiscal and monetary policy are two different things. European Central Bank and the pigs crisis, Eurozone crisis that we have seen. It's yeah, exactly. I think Europe and Jap Japan in the 90s and Eurozone in the last decade, they are prime examples where if you don't solve fiscal problems using fiscal arrangements, but instead you use the central bank or the financial sector to solve these problems, you might you might keep the system going on, which is that you don't risk necessarily a full fledged crisis but you don't recover growth either. You lose productivity, you get into a growth trap. The central bank gets caught in what I was calling a cul-de-sac, which is that it keeps doing more and more of accommodation, but because allocation of capital through the financial system is not improving uh, and you don't get the necessary fiscal measures and support being undertaken, you just don't get a vibrant growth revival that is so crucial. And see, it's even more crucial in a country like India where the population is growing very fast. We have very young population that's entering the job market uh, every month. Uh, and our need to create jobs is far greater than that of advanced economies where per capita uh, incomes are at much, much higher level. See, true, yes. So one quick question. Uh, like recently in RBI's monetary policy committee, they haven't uh, reduced the interest rate like they have been following a tally, but now they are like having status quo. How do you see, like, are we approaching the liquidity trap of basic macroeconomics? Why it means we cannot reduce interest rate beyond a certain point? Uh, see, certainly uh, the interest rates are still at 4%. Uh, the repo rate is at 4% yes. and I believe the reverse repo rate is at 3.25 or 35% or something yes. like that. So uh, why is the rate above zero? It's because our inflation is not exactly benign. You know, last three quarters have been higher than 6% inflation. Uh, if you look at the real rates, uh, therefore the real rates have gone negative. Now, of course, the real rates are negative in many other parts of the world also right now because of the COVID stimulus. But the inflation there, especially in developed markets, is relatively benign. It's less than 2%. Uh, uh, whereas for many emerging markets, uh, notably also for India, inflation is above 6%. And because the government's fiscal is tight, actually, as you know, the oil excise taxes are actually very large. So in a way, you could allow inflation to come down by having a full pass through of the oil prices, but the fiscal doesn't allow that. Uh, and so I think the policy space get, is getting constrained because of a combination of inflation being high, uh, the need for the fiscal to make corrections, which are happening, unfortunately, through fuel uh, excise taxes yeah. rather than rationalization of expenditures and so on. Yeah. Uh, and I would say the third point is that negative real rates with excess liquidity conditions uh, when credit growth is mild, and banking sector, financial sector are not that well capitalized uh, is not a great combination because what happens is that the savers then uh, don't earn much on their deposits because their demand for deposits is not that high because credit is not in demand. Uh, and when deposit rates fall, uh, the savers start looking for search for yield. Uh, into other instruments. When inflation is high, we know they will start going towards gold and real estate. So right now the real estate market is not doing as great. And so I think what we are seeing in India is that there is a chasing of equities because of interest rates being very low on fixed income securities in yes. a real sense. And there is perhaps also a chasing of gold because inflation is beginning to rise again. Uh, in fact, I saw one of the mutual fund managers mention that people are actually cutting back on discretionary spending because of the lockdown, aversion to certain mm -hmm. kinds of consumption because of COVID risk. Uh, and those savings are going into the equity markets. Okay. So negative real interest rates have a tendency to cause froth. 
uh, in certain kinds of risky assets. And I'm concerned that equity markets and gold may have to be watched very, very carefully uh, so that the retail investors who are probably pumping into this. Now, of course, gold is rising internationally as well. Globally, equity markets are rising as well. Uh, negative real interest rates are prevalent there as well. Uh, but uh, I think given our fiscal conditions, given our financial conditions and given our per capita income, uh, costs of stress and financial fragility will be felt much more in India than other places. So I think it would be prudent to be extra careful uh, and not overly lean on the monetary levels. Uh, yes. and, and by not doing that, you actually shift a little bit of the balance back onto the fiscal authorities that you also need to make the necessary adjustments at your end. Yes. A majority of our audience is made up of students. What are the benefits that they can expect out of your book? Uh, thank you, uh, Sanat, for giving me the opportunity to answer that question. Uh, uh, I would say three things. Uh, uh, as you know, the book is a collection of my speeches and minutes uh, while I was on the Monetary Policy Committee. Uh, these speeches were really my lifeblood, so to speak, as a deputy governor. Uh, they were an attempt to be an advocate uh, for change on the important reforms that were needed for financial and macroeconomic stability. They cover a range of topics from resolution of non-performing assets, creating a public credit registry to improve borrowing at the last mile, uh, they talk about development of viable capital markets in India. They talk about how to improve the transmission of monetary policy. Uh, and importantly, they also talk about striking this right balance between the government, the central bank, the markets and the private sector. So overall, I would say it is a very holistic uh, perspective on the financial sector. Uh, the speeches are organized in themes, unlike how they came out chronologically, so that should help the reader. But most importantly, there is this introductory chapter on fiscal dominance, a theory of everything in India. My sense is it has a lot of novel insights, uh, and it's at this in one go, it connects the macroeconomic outcomes, which are like the fiscal outcomes, to the very microeconomic outcomes, such as uh, bank credit outcomes, market regulation outcomes, and so on. So it's a nice blend of micro and macro with a little bit for everyone to learn from. Uh, and importantly, to realize that different parts of the economy are actually working together, either in stabilizing it or destabilizing yes. it. Uh, second, the book also has a very masterful forward by Dr. Vaivi Reddy, the former governor, of course, okay. of the Reserve Bank of India and chairman of the 14th Finance Commission. He gives a very beautiful, uh, very well articulated and convincing historical perspective on fiscal dominance and why the presence of public sector banks uh, actually creates a very particular uh, dynamic in India. He beautifully says that uh, the government, the central bank and the public sector banks sometimes become like a Hindu undivided family where no one keeps track of anyone's accounts. Yes. And I think uh, there's no better way to understand the deep uh, causes of our banking malaise uh, than that. Uh, and third, I would say that um, uh, each of my speeches was written in a particular style. Very often they started with some international evidence or evidence on India. Uh, on the topic at hand, uh, then it spoke about the specific context. Uh, it explained why certain policies have worked, why certain policies have not worked elsewhere. So there was an attempt to draw on the global practices. Uh, and then I would come down to some very specific recommendations. And, you know, you have to, for a sharp message to raise a public debate, you have to make your recommendations very focused. Uh, and I think the reader may benefit from that structure because there's an overarching conceptual framework some data is being put on the table in most of the speeches and then there is some drawing down on the best global practices or the literature and then very specific Indian context recommendations are being made. I think the spirit of the book is very much to create a dialogue, to have a debate, 
to open up issues that are not being talked about uh, as much, but are super, are super important uh, for the long run macro and financial stability. And I hope that many of you and the readers will take this unfinished agenda of restoring financial stability in India forward. I think voice is very important. It's important to have public discourse and debate. And ultimately, if the country wants change, it will have to demand the change. Uh, True. Uh, and then it will come through. So yes. I, I, I hope you find the book engaging yeah. and interesting. Yes, sir, true. I would recommend all the students and the viewers of this video that they should read the book, especially if you are preparing for a prestigious examination, it will help you in your understanding of the Indian economy better. At last, sir, if you have any final words for us, ecoholics. Uh, just two things, uh, Sanat, uh, to all of you, uh, uh, you know, learn the foundations of economics uh, very well. Once the foundations are solid, uh, analyzing complex problems becomes, uh, becomes you know, uh, a facility. It comes, starts coming very naturally to you. Uh, read as much as you can, not just the classic books, but also the interesting contemporary books. Uh, and keep an open eye for uh, good articles in newspapers and, uh, you know, weekly digests such as The Economist. Don't just read about India. Try to also understand the rest of the world. Many economics problems are the same all over the world. They do have oh. their own shades, but we can learn uh, from the experiences of other countries as well. Uh, and third, I would say, um, uh, whenever you are, especially if you are doing some policy work or policy research, try and bring some facts to the table. Uh, I think it always helps uh, if your recommendations are based on some evidence somewhere and it's not just an assertion based on either a purely theoretical argument or something like that. Uh, finally, I would like to wish you, your loved ones and families all the very best uh, in these uh, challenging times. I hope you all uh, stay safe and healthy, uh, take all the due precautions. Uh, and, you know, COVID shows us more than ever that we are extremely interdependent, uh, not just within an economy, but also across the world. And I hope that uh, the infection curves subside soon everywhere and the global economy, not just India, can be on a path of sustained recovery very, very soon. All the very best. Sure, sir. Same to you, your family. And you should also take care. And there must be some daylight coming very soon. And uh, thank you so much, sir, for being a part of our show. It was a delight being able to talk to you because I'm personally a very big fan of you since your RBI days. And I would like to tell our audience that Dr. Acharya's share of proceeds from this book will all go towards Pratham India. Every child in school and learning well for providing education and skilling to underprivileged children and youth in India. We are also running special offers on the book, the links to which can be found in the description. Once again, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, Sanat. Uh, take care.